right, Shalom, Shalom. First and foremost, giving all praise, glory, and honor be to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Rahakwadash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, better known as GMS, who rule well. Peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect, the tabernacle of David. And this is your brother Matazabath. And uh, this is going to be um, part one through this series entitled the book of revelation and we are picking up going into chapter two and um as we go into this chapter i might break this up into two to three parts depending on uh where the spirit leads me because there's a lot of information going into these seven churches so um please bear with me as we continue to go through this series and i pray yahweh rattas our lord's will it is edifying so before we kick off in chapter two, the first church um, out of the seven churches that we're going to tap into, as you can see here on top of the screen, is a message to the church of Ephesus. All right. And uh, when you go into the history of the church of Ephesus, they were one of the most well renowned churches uh, during this time. And uh, before we actually start reading, let's actually go into a little bit of backstory pertaining to um the church of ephesus right so this is from the uh eastern uh bible dictionary all right and just want to give a quick read quick little back history all right so that you can understand um what was going on here uh before we actually get into some details um and actually uh go into the uh scriptures so it says here the capital of the proconsular asia which was the western part of asia minor and it was colonized principally from Athens. And in the time of the Romans, it bore the title of the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. And it was distinguished from the Temple of Diana, who there had her chief shrine and for its theater, which was the largest in the world, capable of containing 50,000 spectators. And it was like all ancient theaters open to the sky. And here were exhibited the fights of wild beast and of men with beast. All right. And it gives you the precepts there. So it says many Jews took up their residence in this city. And here the seeds of the gospel were sown immediately after Pentecost. At the close of his second missionary journey. All right. About A.D. 51. Salakia. So just roll up my windows a little bit. Start to get a little bit chilly. All right, Salakia for that. So it says at the close of his second missionary journey, about A.D. 51, when Paul was returning from Greece to Syria, he first visited this city. He remained, however, for only a short time as he was hastening to keep the feast, probably of Pentecost at Jerusalem. But he left Aquila and Priscilla behind him to carry on the work of spreading the gospel. And it says during his third missionary journey, Paul reached Ephesus from the upper coast, i.e. from the inland parts of Asia Minor and tarried here for about three years. And so successful and abundant were his labors that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Yahweh Shai and both Jews and Greeks, probably during the this period, Salakia, the seven churches of the apocalypse were founded, not by Paul's personal labors, but by missionaries whom he may have sent out from Ephesus and by the influence of converts returning to their homes. And on his return from his journey, Paul touched at Miletus, some 30 miles south of Ephesus and sending for the presbyters of Ephesus to meet him there. He delivered to them that touching farewell charge, which is recorded in Acts, the 20th chapter. All right. Which we're going to grab later on in this lesson. It says <clears throat> Ephesus is not again mentioned till near the close of Paul's life when he writes to Timothy, exhorting him to abide still at Ephesus. OK, and um, just a little side note, um, I believe Timothy was uh, one of the first bishops to. Um, to be bishop over the church of Ephesus. All right. And uh, Lord's will, I can grab that information from Wikipedia. 
But it goes on, it says two of Paul's companions, uh, Trophimus and Tychicus, were probably natives of Ephesus. And in his second epistle to Timothy, Paul speaks of one Sephorus, so like if I mispronounced that, as having served him in many things at Ephesus. He also said to Caiaphas to Ephesus, probably to attend to the interests of the church there. Ephesus is twice mentioned in the apocalypse and the apostle John. OK, according to tradition, spent many years in Ephesus where he died and was buried. All right. So it goes on to say last uh, here, this last part, a part of the site of this once famous city is now occupied by a small Turkish village, Ayas, uh, Ayasaluk, which is regarded as a corruption of the two Greek words, Hagios Theologos, the Holy Divine. OK, so there you have it as a little background foundation going into um, the church of Ephesus and Paul was the you know first one to pretty much set everything up now on that note uh let's come over here to Wikipedia okay um and let me see here because there's some more information that I wanted to get out of this um if I can find it really quickly because you had there was a lot going on. Matter of fact, this is the one I want. There was a lot going on. So this is uh, from Wikipedia, Ephesus and Christianity. So just want to hit some uh, main points here. Um, it says Ephesus was in an important center for early Christianity from the AD 50s. And from AD 52 to 54, the Apostle Paul lived in Ephesus, working with the congregation and apparently organizing missionary activity into the uh, hinterlands initially according to the acts of the apostles paul attended the jewish synagogue in ephesus but after three months he became frustrated with the stubbornness of some of the jews and moved his base to the school of uh tyrannus uh, the jameson Fawcett brown bible commentary re reminds readers that the unbelief of some greek implies that others probably a large number believed and therefore there must have been a community of jewish christians in ephesus all right and basically when you deal with the book of acts it was mainly set up for the apostles to go out their way all right committing you know miracles preaching the gospel it started with the uh, circumcision and then you had the uncircumcision which um started with um cornelius from um acts the 10th chapter right but let me just drop down here uh, to where it says Roman Asia was associated with John, one of the chief apostles in the Gospel of John might have been written in Ephesus. And Ephesus was one of the seven cities addressed in the book of Revelation, indicating that the church of Ephesus was strong. And according to Eusebius of Caesarea, St. Timothy, all right, who was directly under Apostle Paul, was the first bishop of Ephesus. OK, so there you go. All right. Um, because as we go into uh, Revelation, the second chapter, all right, um, you have bishops that were set up over the churches and they were called um, angels. All right. So, you know, you can read this on your own time. This is just, you know, a little bit of um, historical, you know, information dealing with uh, Ephesus and its early parts and um, going into that history on how it got set up with Paul, you know, being the first of the apostles um that pretty much got it you know set up you know so now with that being said let's get into the lesson so revelation chapter 2 starting at the top and it reads it says unto the angel of the church of ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks all right now if you've watched um the first lesson going into Revelation chapter one, we've mentioned towards the end of that chapter about the seven stars in his right hand, which going back in that chapter represented um, the holy angels. All right. The seven archangels. But in this context where it says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, realistically, this is speaking of a bishop, because you got to understand why would Yahweh Shai 
tell John the Revelator to write a letter to the angel that's already in the heavens. It doesn't make sense. All right. Now, to prove that the angel in this context is really speaking of a man that was in charge. OK, over this particular church. Let's get a quick precept. Let's go to Galatians chapter four, because Apostle Paul was called an angel himself. This is Galatians chapter four, and verse 14. It says, in my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of the most high, even as Hamashiach Yahawashai. OK, because when you go into that word angel. All right. You have the Greek word um, angelos, which means a messenger, envoy, one who is sent, an angel, a messenger from the Most High. Straw's definition says um, angelo from Strong's G71 compares Strong's G34 uh, to bring tidings, a messenger, especially an angel, by implication, a pastor. Okay? So. You know, you had the men of the Lord. All right. Beginning with the apostles and stuff. All right. Or, you know, the prophets, they were known as uh, angels of the Lord. All right. And also you can get one more precept. Let's go to the Apocrypha real quick. And let's go to, um, I believe, second address, the first chapter. And uh, it says here, verse 38 on down. And now, brother, behold, what glory and see the people that come from the east unto whom I will give for leaders, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Oshaeus, Amos, and Micaiah, Joel, Abadias, Jonas, Nahum, Abacuc, Zephaniah, Agaius, Zachary, and Malachi, which is called also an angel of the Lord. All right. So even, like I said, even the prophets were uh, known as angels of the Lord, man. Okay. So, Going back to Revelation chapter two, verse one, read it uh, once more. It says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So here it is, Yahweh Shai addressing the church of Ephesus, all right, telling the Ephesians who are Israelites, all right, to whom this message was uh, addressed to that, hey, although, okay, I, I, I'm noticing your zeal, okay, you're out there, you're on fire, all right, your patience, you're bearing everything for my name's sake. Right. And I can see how quickly you are able to rebuke those who are evil and those who are calling themselves apostles. All right. Because you got to remember. All right. When we read the um, a little prelude dealing with the um, the um, the history in the Ephesus, when Paul was Gary to go away, he warned them. All right. Matter of fact, let's let's go there real quick. Let's get Acts chapter 20. All right. And. um See here real quick. Acts chapter 20, and I'm going to start at verse 27. Um, it says, for, actually, we'll start at verse um, 25. It says, and now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of the most I shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of the Most High. So take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of the Most High, which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And through the spirit, we see that happening again in our time here in 2024. OK, 
because you have a lot of brothers that are claiming to be in the truth. OK, corrupting the doctrine. All right. Not calling on the names of Yahweh Bashim al Rashai, calling themselves uh, to be apostles, calling themselves chief uh, high priests. All right. Calling themselves bishops. OK. And they are leading a congregation based upon numbers. OK, it's all it's all about the numbers game with them. All right. And the scriptures, you know, when you read the, the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, majority of all the apostles uh, warned us about these certain men coming in. OK. All right. Whether it be from Yahweh Shai's own mouth, whether it be from Peter, Peter spoke on it. OK, even Timothy. You know, so essentially when we deal with what Yahweh Shai was speaking about, you know, knowing the works and calling them out and, you know, being patient, you know, being steadfast, uh, which also, by the way, this lets you know that Yahweh Shai was down with rebuking other Israelites because you'll have certain brothers in the truth that will say, oh, you know, brother, why you got to get on him? He ain't done nothing every week. It's either you doing a video trying to bring down IUIC or ISUPK. The way I see it is that at least they out there, you know, preaching the truth, cussing out the so-called white man. OK. But see, the problem is the scripture says in Romans, the 16th chapter, you're supposed to rebuke them. OK, that cause controversy or contrary to sound doctrine. And that's what we do. OK, we even get on ourselves. We even get on uh, brothers that are within our close camp. OK, when they're going off. Right. So here it is. Yahweh Shah is commending them saying, hey, yeah, you got a zeal. You on fire. OK, you rebuking those that are claiming to be apostles. OK, you're shining light on the wickedness, the evil. OK. All right. And you have borne the patience. Right. But. Read in verse four, it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. OK. And what is that first love in this context? This the first love represents this truth, this wisdom, knowledge and understanding. And all of you brothers, you can surely attest to when you first came into this uh, wise counsel. Go back to the day you remember when you first woke up to the truth. You became on fire. You had that zeal. You was eager to learn. You was thirsting for that waters. Right. And see, we don't know when you when you go into the history of this particular church. All right. We don't know um, what they could have done because, look, they could have uh, their judgment could have went off. OK. Or they could have let things slide under the table. OK. Whatever was going on during this time. All right. Yahweh Shai had a bone to pick with them because although. The first couple of uh, verses in, okay, he told him, hey, y'all, y'all got the zeal. Y'all, hey, you doing good from this standpoint, but I still got a problem with you. And this is my problem that I have with you is that you forgot your first love. Needless to say, that is you falling off a little bit. So think about that from that perspective. If you how was shy. All right. And because you got to understand the importance of this and Ephesus was one of the biggest churches around that time. It was very well renowned. So understand it from this point that if Yahweh Shai is still coming to the forefront and saying, but although this is the bone that I have to pick with you, how much more us, okay, during these uh, times that we're in in 2024, because remember the scripture says whatever uh, things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So essentially speaking, when reading this, you also have to put yourself in this because this is why the scripture says, let's get a, a precept, second Corinthians. All right. Uh, 13 and verse five, which says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Yahweh Shah Hamashiach is in you except ye be reprobates because this can surely fall under all right you losing thy first love all right so going uh moving on from that let's get um let's get a precept let's go to proverbs chapter five 
All right. And let's start here at verse 16, which says, let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets and let them be only thy own and not strangers with thee. And let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. OK, which realistically, uh, spiritually represents this, um, the scriptures. All right. And we'll get a precept to prove that it says, let her be as the loving hand and pleasant robe and let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Because just like how the heavenly father, Yahweh, all right, through his only begotten son, Yahweh Shai, okay, he made, you know, women in general to have breasts, all right, to have that figure, all right, when, a, you know, when a woman gets pregnant, when your wife gets pregnant, she, she starts to plump out in areas, okay, um, you know, her shape starts to change uh, due to certain hormones and everything else like that, and nine times out of ten, a lot of uh, brothers become attracted to that. Okay, not to digress, but going on, it says in this context, verse 19, let me read it again. Let her be as the loving hand and pleasant row and let her breast satisfy thee at all times, which is it's a metaphor to, to say, you know, um, when you read the scriptures, which this, the, you know, wisdom is likened unto a woman. Okay, you should be div uh, you should become very uh, well conversed within her. OK, if there's anything else you ever do on this planet Earth coming into the truth, get well acquainted with these scriptures because this is your first love. OK, so verse 20 says, and why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? And this is talking about spiritually speaking, dealing with other uh, philosophies. All right. That's why, you know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about. Um, matter of fact, let me just grab it. All right. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let's see. Revelation. Let me type it in. I forgot where it was. Um, all right. I had it. Revelation chapter 14 and verse four. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. And these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto the Most High, into the Lamb. And essentially speaking, this is going into the 144,000. Because when it talks about them being virgins and not defiled with women, all right, that's a metaphor of saying that they stuck to the true sound doctrine. They have not uh, become defiled going into other doctrines all right becoming corrupted that's what it means it's not literally saying that the 144,000 were completely absolute virgins that kept themselves from not having uh sexual intercourse with women no that's not what it's talking about okay it's talking about that they stay true to the 100 sound doctrine you see so they didn't defile themselves by going off the doctrine, tapping into other false philosophies. All right. Uh, Jewish fables, as the scriptures calls them. Right. So let's get one more precept. Let's get the book of Malachi. Uh, I believe chapter two and verse 14, it says, yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord Yahweh hath been witnesses between thee and the wife of thy youth. Going back to what we read in Proverbs, the fifth chapter against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. This is that first love that Yahweh was referring to um, to the church of Ephesus that they fell off on. You see. Because when you come into this truth, matter of fact, let's get a uh, Sirach. Real quick, chapter six. All right. And let's do this right here. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 18. It says, My son, gather instruction from thy youth up 
And so shalt thou find wisdom till thine own age and come unto her as one that ploweth and soweth and wait for her good fruits. For thou shalt not toil much in laboring about her, but thou shalt eat of her fruits right soon. She is very unpleasant to the unlearned. And he that is without understanding will not remain with her. Once again, this is speaking about wisdom, thy first love. And she will lie upon him as a mighty stone of trial. And he will cast her from him ere it be long. Okay, because one of the first things you understand when you first come into this truth and you're on fire is the scriptures tells you that wisdom will try you. Okay, she will discipline you in order for her to trust you. OK, because she's not just going to give you everything that you so long seek it for. OK, if you can't be disciplined in this in this thing, man. And that's why the Bible speaks about, you know, ruling over your own spirit. OK, verse 22, for wisdom is according to her name and she is not manifest unto many. Give ear, my son, receive my advice and refuse not my counsel and put thy feet into her fetters and thy neck into her chain. Bow down thy shoulder and bear her and be not grieved with her bonds and come unto her with thy whole heart and keep her ways with all thy power. So now let's go back to Revelation, the second chapter. Verse four, it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. OK, and that was going into wisdom. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent, <clears throat> Salakia, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So once again, as you can see here, although Yahweh Shai, you know, spoke um, highly at the start to say, hey, you know, I commend you for your zeal. All right. You've been patient. You've been laboring. You've been rebuking false apostles, this, that and the third. Yet I still have a bone to pick with you because, you know, you've left your first love. And again, that's going back into when you first came into this truth. OK, you had a zeal. You was on fire. And so you got to understand when you go deeper into the aspects of what was going on in the church of Ephesus. OK. You had a lot of uh, false uh, apostles uh, around and stuff like that. So much so that, you know, brothers kind of get, you know, long winded. All right. They kind of get taken back from other doctrines and stuff. As a matter of fact, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter four. All right. And um, straight to the point, verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. All right. And, you know, a lot of times also you not only have to deal with that. Right. But falling away. All right. From that first love. OK. Some brothers, you know, when it comes to making videos, lessons, here it is. You might not have the actual balance to where one night, you know, you're not dropping any videos. All right. But you could be studying. Right. And then on uh, certain occasions, you might be not studying as much, but you might be dropping a, a whole lot of uh, videos. And I myself, I had to examine myself in that regard because you really do have to have a balance. All right. You have to have a balance of doing that because you don't want to be falling off. And the best way to keep yourself in check Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five, examine yourself to see if you be in a faith. Prove your own selves. You know. And so this is what Yahweh was saying that, you know, hey, you know. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. And so this is a reminder, you know, uh, started with me first and foremost before anyone else that you have to be examine yourself each and every day, man. OK, you got to be examining yourself each and every day because, you know, Yahweh Shai is it, easy for him through Yahweh. OK, because as the scripture says, no man could come to the father except they come to me. But the scriptures also say that the heavenly father has to pull you into his son. 
So just as it was easy for Yahweh to wake you up to, to through his son to put the Holy Spirit on you to be able to receive this message, it's easy for him to take the Holy Spirit away from you at the same time. And that's why King David. Let's go there real quick. What's that? Psalms 53. Uh, or it could be Psalms 51. Salakia. Yep. Psalms 51 and 11. And this was David's prayer for, you know, a, a contrite spirit, which is what the type of spirit that Yahweh Shemel Shah is dealing with. Verse 11 says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, man. And this should be in all of our prayers day in and day out. So, again, that's why Yahweh Shai said what he said, warning them that unless thou repent, for you know, I come and take thy candlestick away. Okay, because this the 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 law within itself, the law such commandments, is likened unto a lamp. Let's prove that. It's the book of Proverbs, chapter six. Okay, and uh, verse twenty three it says, "For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life." So you don't want, okay. Yahweh shy to come and remove your candlestick if you're not examining yourself and if you don't get back to thy first love, man, which is this truth. Right. Verse six, it says, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. All right. And later on in the series, uh, as we continue to go through in part two of Revelation, the second chapter breakdown. When we go into the history of the uh, Nicolaitans, all right, they were a uh, heretic of a group, okay, that taught false doctrines, and really, they they was their uh, premises was based off, or I should say, their foundation was based off the premises of the doctrine of Balim. Okay, when you go back to uh, the time of um, Numbers. OK, dealing with the king of, uh, you know, the Moabites and when and what uh, they did to the children of uh, Israel. You see. All right. But we'll touch on the Nicolaitans later on in this series. Verse seven, it says he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit hath said unto the churches and to him that overcometh. <clears throat> Salakia, will I give to eat of the tree of life? which is in the midst of the paradise of the most high, right? Because remember that tree of life, which is what we're all striving for to be a part of that number represents, you know, us getting those new bodies represents us coming in under that new covenant. All right. That the heavenly father made to the house of Israel, both Northern and Southern kingdom. Okay. And ultimately not ever, um, suffering, uh, different ailments being in these mortal bodies, which the scriptures uh, calls it chains of darkness, right? But we're going to eat from the tree of life, okay? And that's what, you know, your main goal should be in this thing, man, you know? So that pretty much wraps up <clears throat> this first part, going into the uh, message dealing with uh, Ephesus, all right? And as you can see, it really hones in to how, yeah, you could be a brother in the truth. You could be doing this. You could be doing works and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, Yahweh Shai still had a bone to pick with them. Because although, all right, they had a zeal. Okay, they was doing good works. Okay, he told them, all right, you you still, you um, at when it's all said and done, you've fallen away from your first love. So just understanding that from that, from that sort of heightens in a sense, right? You got to look at yourself and be like, man, OK, although, you know, you, you might be going out on the highways and byways or you might be putting up videos, you might be studying. All right. But ask yourself, have you left your uh, first love, which is this truth? Are you examining yourself each and every day? Are you showing brotherly love? OK, are you walking the way that Yahweh Shah walk, man? These are the sort of questions you really got to be asking yourself because for such a church as Ephesus, which was a very high uh, type of church, all right, in terms of its status going back then, Yahweh Shah still has something to pick with them, man. So how much more us at the end of the day reading the accounts, okay, of what John the Revelator was going into when he wrote the uh, visions down, 
All right. So that completes part uh, one of Revelation. All right. Chapter two, dealing with the first church being of Ephesus. And I pray that this was uh, edifying. All right. So giving all praise, glory and honor be to Yahweh. By Hashem, Yahweh Shai. By Hashem, Rakakwadash. Once again, double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, better known as GMS, who rule well. Peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect. Stay tuned for part two in the series, the book of Revelation. Until next time, Shalom.